Good afternoon, everyone. Thank you. And welcome to the Orlando Central Board's Editorial Board interview with the candidates for the Apopka Centered House District 39. Um, today, we are joined by Douglas Bankson. He's a Republican who won his primary and has served as a city councilman and vice mayor in the city of Apopka. And we also have with us Tiffany Hughes. She's a Democrat who is the youngest person ever to serve as the president of the Orange County NAACP. Um, and we also have with us today, Scott Maxwell, who is our columnist, everybody knows Scott, and Natalia Jaramillo, who is our newest reporter. She is going to be covering Osceola County for us. And she is covering this race for the Sentinel. Um, and we welcome them both. Um, and we are going to go ahead and get started. Um, and um, the first question that we have is starting next year, um, the volume of federal money that swelled Florida's budget to beyond $110 billion is going to start drying up. What does Florida need to do to adjust to that pending budget cut? And um, where should the spending priorities be to best meet, fit the needs of District 39? And um, Mr. Bankson, you won the toss on this one. We start with you, please. All right. Well, first of all, thank you to the ed editorial board. And uh, we appreciate this opportunity to be able to speak directly to people. Um, yes, uh, we've seen an, an absolute uh, windfall of uh, the, the funds that are flowing to us, but as uh, having served here in Apopka for the last six years, one of the things that I just was able to accomplish is make sure that we have a stable reserve policy uh, because those reserves dry up fast. So number one, we need to not spend like a drunken sailor, no offense to sailors. Uh, we need to make sure that we're focusing those things on that which uh, builds up our infrastructure. Uh, for me, safety and infrastructure are job one. And once we uh, undergird our safety and undergird our infrastructure, then we can build upon that. So making sure that we invest in infrastructure, I think, is key. Uh, again, knowing that uh, these funds will not last forever, uh, we need to make sure that we create an environment for business to succeed. Uh, we have, we uh, employ almost 50 employees ourselves in our school, and uh, so it's the small businessman really is the backbone of our, our society here in Apopka or in, in uh, Florida. And specifically in our area, we need to make sure that we undergird our agricultural uh, sector. Um, obviously, everyone has to eat. That's a sustainable industry and something that we need to make sure that we're undergirding, as well as that which uh, in, here in Central Florida, we have our industries for hospitality and uh, entertainment. Uh, these are key industries. And so as we undergird those and make sure that they can prosper and do well, then our people, they will have job security. And so we see the economy beginning to uh, uh, resound and, and resurge uh, coming out from under all of the mandates that we've had to face. So uh, I believe that's a real sound way investing in our own in infrastructure. And again, in our district here, much of that is, is agricultural in basis. Thank you very much. Ms. Hughes, let's same question. Well, thank you so much to the editorial board. Again, my name is Tiffany Hughes. And while I uh, am the immediate past president of our Orange County branch NAACP, I think what's most important is that I own a local small business, a staffing firm uh, for the last seven years. And I have grown that business from zero dollars to uh, multi, a multi-million dollar organization. So really, when I think about what our state needs to do to make sure that we continue to have the resources to support Floridians and certainly to support District 39 it is certainly in small business development. District 39 is, um, it's amazing. It really is. You can start in Zellwood and get into our agriculture, our farms, places like H&A. We move into Apopka, uh, one of the, uh, the, at least the second largest municipality in Orange County. We move into Winter Garden that has really boomed in terms of small business economics and commerce. And how do we continue to build on uh, what we've done, not just in District 39, but as a state in general, it's investing in small businesses, making sure that 
our bottom line is sound in order to continue to build into our budget. If we are investing in small businesses, we are investing in the employees of those businesses that continue to uh, grow our tax base. We are investing in what those uh, businesses are inputting into our communities. And just to take that a step further, what I do um, for my business is staffing. And what we need is a I want to say an influx, but a investment in workforce development. We know that we are in one of the greatest states, of, if not the greatest state, and in the greatest region in our state for high tech, high earning manufacturing jobs. I do a lot of work in construction. Aerospace development has really boomed with businesses like Red Six coming to our region. And if we continue to grow those bases and we continue to grow the budget for our state and continue to invest in our communities. Okay. Thank you very much. I'm going to move on to a uh, rather specific question, and I uh, might uh, uh, follow up with some more specifics for, uh, from you guys. It has to do with abortion. Obviously, we had the overturning of Roe versus Wade. A number of legislators in the majority party have said they want f uh, further restrictions. The governor has indicated as much. Can you tell us specifically what restrictions and exceptions there should be for uh, women uh, and abortion in Florida? And we'll start with you, Ms. Hughes, if any, of course. Thank you so much, Scott. Um, certainly abortion, abortion access and reproductive health care are a very important issue to me. Um, I have a two year old son. I talk about him all the time. Legacy and what I do not talk about most often is that the year before I had legacy, I had fibroids removed. And that made my pregnancy with legacy high risk. And part of having a high risk pregnancy is having some very difficult conversations with your family and your doctors. And I'm so thankful that I'm here to raise him, that legacy is here, healthy, strong, uh, scratching up his knees. But that issue is very personal. And what we saw in the legislature is that we have a 15 week abortion ban that does not even make exceptions for rape or incest. And at the very least, we need to be leading with kindness. We need to be uh, leading our state, uh, making sure that we are keeping reproductive access uh, open. And certainly when I think of um, the most complex of situations where a woman, where um, her family needs to have all the options on the table, um, I wanna make sure that our medical professionals have um, the room that they need to save lives uh, and certainly think of mothers. And I look forward to supporting our legislature, uh, women, families, uh, doctors, and certainly our, our faith in that effort. I appreciate those generalities. I warned you in advance I was going to push for specifics. Laws are about spe specifics. Right now, the law is 15 weeks. You cannot have an abortion uh, after 15 weeks. Is there a time period that you think that should be A and B? Uh, I think I heard you say there should be exceptions, but I wanted to be clear about that. There absolutely should be exceptions for rape and incest and the life of a mother. And Scott, if I'm honest, I am not a medical professional. But what I know is that 99% of abortions occur before 21 weeks. And anything beyond that is typically okay. a very complex situation where that mother, that doctor, that family needs every option on the table. And I don't want as a uh, legislator to step in between a doctor, a medical professional who has spent their time um, in the practice of treating uh, women, uh, particularly in uh, stepping in the middle of that to save a life. Those decisions must be left between that woman, her family, her faith, and her doctor. Mr. Bankson, uh, do you want to tell what, what, what your thoughts are on uh, abortion and what, where, what restrictions there should be and when, if any, there should be exceptions? Sure. Again, number one, I believe in a culture of life um, I, and being pro-life advocate. Uh, when this passed in 1973, I was 10 years old. I remember having the, these discussions with my mother and, and what is the right and what is the wrong and where are we as a nation? Right now, we're struggling with all those things. At that time, they said that we really don't have the science to give us the answers that we need. So the focus was on the issue of privacy, which I absolutely believe in privacy. It's foundational to our nation. But they said at that time, if we can see by science that we, we have more evidence to know when this life truly begins, then we need to immediately shift this policy because every individual has rights. And is this a person? So that's the debate that's really happening now across the nation. And uh, I'm concerned when I see some of the things that are happening, as in California, where uh, they're proposing that up to 28 days after childbirth that a, a child can be terminated. 
this is a, a very scary thing uh, where we're going there. So when it comes to abortion, obviously it's a it's a very personal issue. It's an issue that we need to uh, to walk through with compassion. Uh, that's really my life is based upon that as a minister that we have compassion for everyone that we respect each individual but again each individual has rights especially those who are unborn we need to protect them specifically can you and tell your constituents do you believe a woman ever has a right to an abortion and if so in what instances well obviously we need to protect life so if a woman's life is at stake if there's a, a medical issue going on we need to have that option to protect them but my point is we need to protect the child as well do everything we can to save life and to save both lives um, uh, my grandmother who just turned 104 in july shared with me very recently a story that i had never known that when she was about to give birth to my father uh, who was the only child she was able to give birth to uh, the doctors basically said, you're going to have to make a choice. It's either you or your child. And obviously, Mr. Banks, and with all due respect to your grandmother, uh, I'm just looking for a number here. <laughs> uh, okay. I, and I've yet to hear it from you. I think you're saying you do not support the women's right to have an abortion unless the, her safety is at stake. But I, I, I'm not sure I'm hearing you correct. That's what I want to. Well, yeah. And that was the case there for her <laughs> having to make that choice that uh, obviously there was a medical issue that had gone on. And she chose obviously to, to save him and she lived up to 104. Uh, but they told her after that she would never have the option to have other children because of her reproductive system. So uh, every story is different. And that's why I bring that up, that we need to be compassionate. We need to look towards these things. Uh, but uh, we also need to value life at its core. And that, that's really my heart, Thank my culture you. of life. Um, I wanted to shift our focus to um, a little bit further um, down the line, which is the, um, the uh, question of um, public schools. Um, one of the looming crises that's been identified is what many people say is going to be a pending teacher shortage. And I'd like to get your, um, from both of you, an idea of what Florida should be doing now to prepare to, to hire professional qualified teachers and um, make sure that we have enough for the coming years. Mr. Bankson, can we start with you? Yes, absolutely. Um, again, as I mentioned, uh, my grandmother, 104, she was an educator all of her life. And so I really have a passion for education. And, and for us ourselves, we actually have started a private school as well. I have over 270 students, two thirds of which are minority students that are doing very exceptional because we have those options for them. So for our teachers, number one, we need to make sure that we're competitive in our, our teaching rates. As for anything, we need to make sure that we're paying them really uh, a wage that they can live upon and they can uh, really continue to thrive in what they do and not feel the pressure of being able to make it. Many of them are literally taking out of their own pockets just to provide supplies because they do this because they love the kids, they love to teach. And so we need to make sure that they can do that without being hindered. And, and uh, gratefully, uh, our governor has uh, done a great job in raising those rates and making sure that our teachers can get an increase. And so again, as in every industry, we need to make sure that we're competitive there and that way being able to draw in uh, the teachers uh, that we're needing to, to fill the docket as we go forward. Thank you. Um, Ms. Hughes, same question. Thank you so much, Chris. Um, Florida, our school system is very personal for me. I am a product of Florida public schools. I graduated uh, from a school in Charlotte County and then went on to uh, FIU in Miami. And what we need to do is fully fund our school system, particularly our public education system. Every child must have the opportunity to learn, grow, and reach their fullest potential. And that does involve investing in our, the teachers that invest in our, ba our babies, our little leaders. Again, I have a two-year-old son. So education and how our school system functions is personal for me. When I show up to our Seminole County School Board meetings, when I show up to our Orange County School Board meetings, I'm speaking on behalf of what will be my child in school and every child that's in school right now. So we have to fully fund our public education system. We have to support our teachers by giving them a salary uh, that they deserve and really keeping politics and politicians out of the classroom. I have a mentee at Seminole County Public Schools. I went 
went to visit her last week and just had some conversations with our high school students about what how they feel is going uh, about what's going on. How is that affecting uh, their school lives? And if I'm honest, uh, it didn't seem to um, it, it seemed as though politics and politicians were making uh, much larger of an issue than what our students actually need. And, and we have to continue to keep our students uh, the uh, top of mind, make sure that they are the focus and fully uh, pay our teachers what they deserve for their profession because they are pouring into what will be the leaders of our country. I'll change uh, gears again, and maybe this one be, can be a sort of a lightning round. As you may know, uh, the legislature is in charge of controlling what hotel taxes can be spent on. Um, in other states, uh, hotel taxes are spent on things like uh, parks and buses and cops. Uh, mm -hmm. That tourism do a strain, uh, put a strain on. That has not traditionally been the case in Florida. I'm wondering if you support uh, changing the usage of uh, hotel taxes in Florida, and if so, in what way? Uh, and we'll start with you, Miss Hughes. Thank you so much, Scott. We know that tourism is uh, one of, if not the largest tax driver within our region. And we need to make sure that the tax dollars, the tax revenue that are supporting our hotels and our lodging associations are going back into those hotels and lodging associations because those businesses are also pouring into our tax budget and also supporting our police officers, our roads, our infrastructures, and where uh, there is a need there. Uh, we lean into our businesses accordingly, but I really truly believe that the funds generated from our tourism industry really need to be poured back uh, holistically into our tourism industry. Okay, thanks very much. And Mr. Bankson? Uh, yes, uh, we've got a, a Jenga block, I, I call it a stack when it comes to our taxes. We've robbed Peter to pay Paul in many different areas, and this is one of them. And so for our TDT taxes, we've got to make sure that that does support its original intention. Uh, just like Sadowski Fund has been uh, used in other purposes, and it, it, it raids our ability to bring in and, and uh, secure our workforce. So in many different areas, uh, we've got to make sure the taxes are what they were intended for. And so I think that's a particular issue for our industry here, uh, our, our hotels, our entertainment industry, is that's what it was designed to do, and it has been siphoned off. So we've got to make sure and put it back uh, that it can be used for that rather than using that and then raising another tax, a 1% tax to, to make up for that. And so it, it all becomes convoluted. So we've got to get it all back to what it was designed for. I understand in times of pressure, like going through COVID, uh, we've had to do what we, we had to do to make sure and get forward, but we've got to now bring it back uh, legislatively to its original intent. Okay, thank you very much. I wanted to ask you both, Governor made a fairly a series of fairly controversial decisions um and that um i'm sorry i'm um in that um in removing some public officials from public office um that included some Broward county school board members and um in hillsborough county the state attorney do you believe that the governor has unlimited authority to remove um, people from public office, and do you believe he's using that authority appropriately? Um, and let's start with uh, Ms. Hughes. Thank you so much for that question, Chris. Uh, with regard to the governor removing uh, democratically elected representatives, um, I, I have to take it a step back here. Uh, the legislature, makes the laws. And so if we allow our governor the rule uh, or the ability to make such decisions, uh, whether we like it or not, that is the rules as they stand. And if we don't like it, it is our opportunity to change it. But I also think it's very dangerous to remove democratically um, elected officials from their position. The people uh, elected those uh, representatives to represent them in, in, in the appropriate way, in the way that they know best. And to remove them says that the people don't know best. And we are taking it a step further to say that our democracy uh, is not exactly what we'd like it to be. Uh, so we have to really keep uh, abreast of uh, democracy and what uh, the people of our communities uh, want and who those people elect to represent them. Thank you. Um, Mr. Bankson. 
Uh, yeah, actually, uh, again, we have a democratic republic, and so we are elected, but then we're elected to represent the people, and we have certain power within those positions. I do believe the governor has made some wise decisions because uh, we want to be held accountable. The people need accountability in government. And so when someone has been hired basically to do a job and they refuse to do that job, then there is uh, within our legislature and within our executive power, the right to remove those individuals if they will not uphold what the people have asked them to do. So to me, it's a measure of accountability. And I think people are crying out uh, for politicians, for elected officials and appointed officials to be accountable. And that's one of the checks and balances that we do have. Uh, within our, our system of government. So there are powers that are designated there. And I, I think that uh, they've needed to be used to make sure that people are doing their job. Thank you very much. Um, I, I really wish that we had more time. Um, we have come rapidly to the um, part where we talk about your closing statements. Um, but, but, you know, I'm, I'm sure everybody watching this can think of a dozen items that we haven't had time to touch on so um we we hope that um we hope that you take the time to look at both candidates we will be making a recommendation in that in this race but we don't mean that as the be all and end all both candidates have websites that are very informative you also have our excellent coverage by natalia and we will have um, a wealth of information on this race. And we urge you to take a look at both candidates and um, decide who best represents your interests in the Papka and Zellwood and the, all the surrounding communities. Okay, so um, as I said at the beginning, I did kind of flip a coin and, and, and pick somebody to start first with closing statements. Um, Ms. Hughes, um, I would like you to take a minute and a half or so to kind of tell us why you would be the best choice in this in this race. Well, Chris, Natalia, Scott, uh, the viewers at home, thank you so much for sharing this time with us. When I think about why I'm running uh, for Florida House of Representatives, I really think about the people of House District 39. I think about uh, the students at Apopka High School attending class that is overcrowded, underfunded. I think about our retirees struggling to pay for their prescriptions and their housing costs. I think about our parents sitting around a dining room table at night talking about how they're gonna pay for their kids' college when the, the price of housing is, is rising um, and how they're gonna put food on their table. Uh, so I really wanna speak directly to the voters at home that are watching this because you deserve a representative who will put aside partisan politics and focus on the issues. And I really want everyone at home to remember that a vote for Tiffany Hughes is a vote for lower housing costs and higher wages. A vote for Tiffany Hughes is a vote to protect our children, our babies from gun violence and to strengthen our public education system. A vote for Tiffany Hughes is a vote to protect the woman's right to access life-saving reproductive health care. So please join us by visiting tiffanyhughes.vote and by voting on or before election day, November 8th, because your vote matters. Thank you. Thank you. Mr. Bankson. Yes, again, thank you to the editorial board and to our viewers. It's such a privilege to be able to get our message out to you. For me, uh, I've lived here for 30 years in our district and this is home. I've raised my family here and now my favorite title is Papa. I have my, my two-year-old granddaughter who's a joy of my heart. And that's really what the core of this is. I'd, I'd like to just be spending all the time at home doing those things, but there's such a cause. which That's uh, things that are going on in not only in our nation, but right here in our district. I've served for the last six years as a city commissioner and vice mayor, and I, I really feel that I have a heartbeat uh, of what we're dealing with in the area and in the region, and uh, really want to be that representative, be that voice up in Tallahassee to make sure that we're not passed over. 
Um, obviously, people are facing a lot of issues right now. As I walk door to door, having some great interaction with different ones, and uh, we see the economy is such an important thing. When people have had to be making choices between their gas tank and their supper table, something's wrong. I've got the experience that I've stood against raising our taxes and making sure that we operate efficiently so that that's not further borne upon the taxpayers. At the same time, in a nonpartisan position, I've had the ability to um, to work together with people across the table and, and truly get things done. And so for me, uh, that's the bottom line. People are tired of just sitting in a, a ditch warfare as in World War I. We've got to move forward. We've got to work together. I've got experience doing that. And I would just love to be that uh, representative voice. Again, I care about and have a great compassion for our education. It's about our kids. And we need to make sure to give the options that we have every option to see people succeed and uh, have the experience to do it. I have the heart to do it and would love to be a representative. DougBankson.com. Go on there and make sure to to uh, get us your support on November 8th. Thank you very much.